And first and foremost, I want to, be, uh, to greet everybody a happy Thanksgiving, a blessed Thanksgiving to everyone. But also, I just wanted to say that I feel like, I don't know if you feel this as well, as well that I feel like that every day there is an attempt, a, somehow a, a, a blitz, a, a propaganda trying to convince me that I'm not truly happy with my life or in my life and there is something that is missing in my life. I feel that, especially now during this season where Thanksgiving, Black Friday, you know, Cyber Monday is, com is coming. There's this propaganda that I sense, that I feel, trying to indoctrinate me, trying to tell me that somehow I'm not really happy with my present life. You know, these attempts are subtle, simple, and also unrelenting. It comes in different waves. It comes as I turn on my phone or I look at my phone when I wake up in the morning. Also, when I turn on my TV, my computer, radio, for those who are still, you know, into radios, or maybe when you turn your radio, when you're dri driving, going to work, to the moment that I turn all of those devices at night. So there's that subtle, simple, and yet unrelenting attempt to bombard me, to suggest that I am not really happy, and I needed something to be happy in this life. And this campaign unrelenting campaign is really telling me that I need to buy a certain car for me to be happy, move to a certain neighborhood for me to feel great, uh, wear a certain type of dress or clothes for me to feel good about myself, or shoes that I have to wear for me to feel a sense of satisfaction. And also, you know, some perfume that I have to splash on my body for people to like me. Or, you know, some colleges that my kids need to go for me to feel a little bit more, you know, fulfilled as a parent that I have really did real, really good or really well in raising my kids. I don't know about you, but I have felt that. Maybe you have felt that as well. Or maybe you have experienced that as well. But the sad part of all of this is that most of us, or some of us, have believed this lie. Yes, they could try, but the problem is this. Some of us have taken a bite. We have believed this lie. We all taken a bite of this lie. We all went after what we think will make us happy, this stuff, only to find out that it didn't work. You got the clothes, you put on that perfume, you are driving that car, you are living now in a certain neighborhood. In fact, we were happier, some of us, before we started this quest of pursuing all of those. You know why? We've been looking for contentment in wrong places. As a result, we are now living in a very discontent culture. And that is the description. In fact, if there is a song, an anthem, okay, that could sum up and summarize this culture of discontentment. It's actually a song that was released in 1965. And it goes like this. And some of you, you may not relate to this. If you're a little bit younger, I can't. I just heard it. Someone was playing it on one of the gatherings that I attended before. And the song is this. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. And I think that's what it is. And I'll try. And I try. I can't get no. Dun, dun, dun. So see, I have some backup, backup singers here. But I think that's the theme. That is the theme of people. Because we have taken a bite on all of this. And now we are, we are living in this culture that is a discontent.
culture. So that said, the question here today that we're going to answer as we read our text, as we look at what we're studying here today is this. So what's the secret to contentment? It seems like in the midst of all of this, while we hear this barrage of, you know, brainwashing, a barrage of propaganda, okay, where is the secret to contentment? Paul gives us an answer to this question in the verses that we are going to study this morning. And I want you to open your Bible, please, Philippians chapter 4. And it's starting on verse 10. And for those who, uh, for you who've just joined us for the first time, we are in a series called Joyful in Christ. We've been studying the letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the Philippi. And we are almost done after this Sunday. There's one more uh, uh, preaching or one more um, topic that I'm going to talk about, which is joyful in generosity or finding joy as we are ge generous. And today is about contentment. I think this is just fitting for us as we celebrate Thanksgiving. Just fitting is because every November we talk about a series on finances to educate us and one of these important aspects in our life. So let me read, starting on verse 10 and continuing to what we talked about last week. Verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. At last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Lord, help us as we look at your text today. Lord, help us to understand your message. Help us, God, to understand Lord, how to live in contentment. It's just like what the Apostle Paul said. He had learned this secret. It's no longer a secret because he's sharing it to us today. Help us, Lord, as your people. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, we saw how Paul urged and challenged the saints to stand firm in the Lord. He said that we have to stand firm against this unity. Stand firm against Satan's attempt to steal our joy. We have to stand firm against, you know, a worry, but we have to pray. You know, do not be anxious, but we have to pray and seek the Lord. And we have to stand firm against what? The last portion that we talked about there. Let me just read that. I just kind of like went black and I forgot. Stand firm against a negative uh, thinking or critical spirit. And today he continues with this and start with his word in verse 10. Look at that in the first part. I rejoice greatly in the Lord at, the, at last that you have renewed your concern for me. Paul goes back to the initial reason and purpose of writing this letter, not only to encourage the saints in Philippi, but to thank them for their gifts. Remember this? We studied this in our first lesson, uh, second week of this uh, book series uh, uh, in the book of Philippi, in verse 3, here's what he says in verse 3 to 5. So I thank my God every time I remember you. In my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Look at this in verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, Paul was expressing an attitude of gratitude. He was being grateful because if there is one church that have stood with Paul, is the church in Philippi. But interesting about the Apostle Paul, he never shared publicly that he was in need. That is what I like about him. So for some reason, the, 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 the church in Philippi found out what was going on in the life of the Apostle Paul. Look at the second part of verse uh, 10. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Uh, to, to, to show it. I'm inclined to believe that, you know, Paul stresses here that he's not seeking to solicit gift from them or to ask another fund from them, but rather, as we read this, it is very uh, what uh, 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 it's very clear in this context that 
we could intelligently assume that the Philippians found out about Paul's need on their own. They found out that he was in prison. But you have to understand, at this particular situation, there's a, it's, it's one thing to discern the need of a person, but there's also another thing to quite to what? Quite respond to that need. Because most of us, we discern the needs in the lives of people. But the question is, are we responding to those needs? But if the church in Philippi did so. They heard, maybe from the great vine, that Paul was arrested, of course. He was a popular figure in the churches then. That he was arrested and taken to Rome. So now, here's what they need to accomplish. They have to raise the money while they are, what? Undergoing trial. You have to read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. That Macedonian church that Paul mentioned, that even though they were going through difficulty, but yet they gave, this is the church, the church in Philippi. Because they are the church in Macedonia. So now they've known about Paul's situation, but yet because of their concern, even though they're going through difficulty, they still decided to give. It's interesting because we're going to talk about that next week. I don't want to be expounding on that because as we end that the, the, this uh, um, uh, series, that's the exact uh, text that Paul used here. Giving beyond, the generosity beyond our circumstance. So it's just interesting for me that people's giving, when it comes to giving to the Lord, is just based on their feelings. But for them, it's not. Also, getting that gift to Paul was another challenge. You have to understand, we are in Macedonia or Philippi, which is part of Greece, and they're sending the gift to Rome. Approximately about six to 7,000 miles. You know, that's far. You know, they have to, they cannot just write a check, send a Venmo or a Zelle that we have today. They have to send their gift through a messenger, which is, Epaphroditus, we've read that. Look at this in Philippians chapter one, uh, chapter 2, actually. Uh, it's wrong there. It's my mistake. It's chapter 2, verse 25. I made that mistake. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow workers and fellow soldiers, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. So they sent someone. Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was not just a bearer of gift. He was a gift to Paul as well. The journey took time. But yet, they responded. And this letter at the very beginning, Paul was thanking them. Paul, Paul was saying, thank you for the gift that you have sent. The person that you have sent to encourage me, even in this difficult situation. But yet also, quick, quickly, Look at verse 11. He uses this opportunity not only to <coughs> thank the church in Philippi, but to use this moment to teach them a lesson. And what is that lesson? A lesson about contentment. Because look at this. Verse uh, chapter 11, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. I am not saying this because I am an, I am in need. What was Paul saying here? Indeed, Paul is expressing his got his attitude, his gratitude. However, Paul was quick to clarify to them, or he doesn't want to give this impression that the Lord was not sufficient for his every need. He was just like saying, thank you for your gifts, but guess what? Let me use this opportunity to teach you about contentment. Because yes, I am grateful to your gifts that you have given, but yet, I want you to understand that God is more than enough in my life. He doesn't want believers to think that he had been discontented before the gift arrived. But he doesn't want them also, uh, he, but he does want them to know that their generosity was truly appreciated. So he combines this section of the letter. He combines generosity or gratefulness as a lesson, but also a valuable lesson about contentment. And that's the topic that we're going to talk about today. So what about this lesson? Okay, what about what's what about this lesson or the lesson about contentment that Paul is teaching the church in Philippi that we could learn from? Are you ready? So as you feel that bombardment, as that 
advertisement is that you're watching or as you turn on your um, phone or computer, especially this week, we're in, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Now this is going to be calling you more and more. So what about the lesson? Okay. What about the lesson contentment now that we need to learn? Here's the first one. According to Apostle Paul, contentment is learned through our experience in Christ. Contentment is learned through our experience in Christ. What do you mean by this? Let's look at this text. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance, according to the Apostle Paul. And also in the last part of verse 12, he said this. I have learned the secret of being content in any and in every situation. The first lesson that Paul wanted to teach all of us is that regarding contentment is that it's not normal mm -hmm. or a normal attitude to be contented, but yet it is a skill that can be learned. But I have to quantify this. It is a skill through our relationship in Christ. Why? Because if you look at and study the word learn in those two texts that I've put there in verse 11 and verse 12, okay, that text means knowledge through experience. Paul was saying, I have learned not just information, but something that I've learned through my experience in my walk with God, I have learned to be content. Interesting, isn't it? Through his experience in Christ. It was an expression used to describe an initiation by experience. In short, Paul was saying, through what I have experienced in my walk in Christ or with Christ, here's what it is. I have learned to be content. Notice the language here. Contentment didn't come naturally to Paul. Yep. Yes, he was a learned man. We've learned that a few weeks ago, that he was what? A Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrew, and all of the qualification that he had told us. But yet, here's what he said. When it comes to contentment, nothing here. But I've experienced that through my relationship in Christ Jesus. He had many experiences in life. Okay? Most of them are challenging and difficult. He was shipwrecked, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you want to read the context there. Shipwrecks, imprisonment, scourging, stoning, beating, and many more hardships were routine to the Apostle Paul. But yet he looked back and said, guess what? In all of those situations, I have learned to be, what? Content. The situations, the trials, the difficulty. Wow. So here's what it is. If you are experiencing some difficulty, maybe you're experiencing some, like what Paul says, plenty in need or in want. Whatever the circumstance is, that is what? As you go and go through that challenges, as you go through that prosperity, guess what? There's a lesson that God wants us to learn. And that is what? Contentment. So, but the people sometimes, what we experience is that sometimes we go through this situations and trials and abundance, etc., etc., and yet we have not learned to be content. Some of us have went through this. So what's the reason? Paul was, uh, what? He learned through this, but the difference is this. God used the trials, the blessings, the abundance, having plenty or having in want, to teach Paul about contentment. Because why? It is a process, something that we learn as we walk with God every day. So I want you to look up here. How could God teach you about contentment when you, what? When you are in need, if you're not going through that when you are in need. You have to go, go through that. So some of you, you are that. You're experiencing that. And some people say, you that. But you're not learning. Because instead of trusting God that he will provide for you, you're making ways in your own strength, in your ability to solve the problem, to get ahead of God. And some of us, we're experiencing abundance. 
And sometimes God, the way God teaches us is to be what? To be generous to other people because in the process when God takes something away from us and we give it to other people, God is teaching us that in abundance we could be content because God is the one who's going to provide for us. Do you see the lesson? And sometimes I've experienced this in my life, to be honest with you. I have experienced, like Paul, to be in need. I have nothing, but yet I've prayed and asked God. I didn't announce my need to, every, to anyone. Only to the Lord and to the closest people that I have shared my need and what was going on in my life. And to what? To instruct them that they are excused from helping me in providing for that need. But I only ask them to pray. And true enough, in that abundance or in that need, God had taught me contentment because in the process, God had taught me to be generous in both and to be satisfied and to, to trust Him, not Robert's ability to do something, to create something. We need to learn this lesson from God. The problem is this. At the same time as we learn from God, we need to unlearn the lesson that the world had taught us. And what is the world teaching us? Here's what the world is teaching us. That we can get what we want based on our own ability and strength. Lesson. The outcome, if we follow the world, we can get what we want. But the problem is this, we find out, or we will find out, or we will find out, we will find out, that it can never make us happy. Therefore, we are discontent. So what example of that? It's reflected in our culture. Look at what's going on in our culture. Here's how it's manifesting. We have a high percentage of consumer debt. We aren't content to live within our means. That's why when you go through what? A challenges of needing or you are in need or not in abundance. What we do is that we rack up more debts instead of living within our means, being content. Then, so we go into debt just to live a little better than we can afford. Then we suffer anxiety and our pressures in paying bills. Next is that our discontent is reflected in the high rate of mobility of people. People rarely stay at, at the same address for more than five years. I'm not saying if you've heard from the Lord to move from somewhere, by all means, go because you have heard from God. But people are just following the money trail, if you ask me. Money trail. We're always on the move. We're following where, you know, we, we, we are. Uh, God sometimes is teaching us to, 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 you know, to learn this being content in, 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 in need. And then we follow the money trail instead of praying to the Lord. I'm not saying that don't seek God's blessing. But sometimes God allows those situations to teach us. And also, how is this reflected as well in this high rate or high percentage of relational dysfunction that we see today in our society? We can't find happiness in our relationships. We move from one relationship to another, right? We trade our partner with a different partner is because we feel um, uh, discontent after discontent. The same problem occurring over and over again. We get what we want, but we still, we're not happy. Because you have not learned the lesson. And also, we don't get what we want. We get what we want, but we are not happy. Then the other one is that we don't get what we want, and then we get mad at God. God, you have abandoned me because I lost my job. Maybe you lost your job because you're lazy. I'm just saying. Or you're always late. And then you blame God. 
And some of us we really lost our job because of this COVID pandemic. But it doesn't mean that God has abandoned you at this particular season. What is God teaching you? Maybe just to be content at this particular moment until you find another job. Contentment does not depend on circumstance, according to the Apostle Paul. It comes from a relationship and reliance upon God. That's why that's the first lesson can be learned through our experience in Christ. It comes with our relationship with God. It is possible to be content, even joyful in every, in every circumstance. Habakkuk said that. You know, Though the fig tree fails to blossom, and there'll be no fruit on the vine. And the field yields no fruit. I will praise you, Lord divine. Yes, will I praise thee even in the night. Maybe Hebrews chapter 6 verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Because we are contented because of our relationship with Christ. Number two, here's the lesson in contentment. Contentment is being grateful for God's blessing. Contentment is being grateful for God's blessing. The second lesson according to Apostle Paul as you read the text is this. That contentment is being satisfied, being grateful with God's blessing, whatever the circumstance and in every in every situation. Look at the Apostle Paul here. I know what it is to be in need, he said. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. Very interesting about that because he said, I have learned the secret because he is taking a jab at the uh, uh, existing um, philosophy of stoicism that is going on in that particular time. Okay, that there's certain religious group that, uh, you know, for them to be content is for them to find the nirvana or find a certain Shangri-La or some situations like that. But so Paul was, you know, for, for, for a lot of religions, it's all about the secret that you have to pursue. But for the Apostle Paul, he is giving out the secret right now. And he said, being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. One of the most alarming statistics in our society today is a growing number of ungrateful people. Ungrateful people, even among believers. Sad to say, even among Christians. In, in an article that I was reading uh, entitled, an American children ungrateful. Are American children ungrateful? Question mark rather. By Hank Felsher, as the research suggests that we may be raising a generation that is missing out on the benefits of gratitude. Because we're raising a generation that is ungrateful according to him. And according to him, the value of gratitude is falling. And more so when they did the study, you know, they study from the east to west. And they have seen this and more so toward west. To summarize this article, he said that the, that the leading cause or the leading culprit of this ungratefulness is this, is entitlement. Quoting an article in his, um, quoting an article from Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, he, he called this an entitlement epidemic, a chronic epidemic that is infecting our culture today. We are raising kids that doesn't know how to be grateful. That's why Paul was saying, you need to be what? You need to learn about contentment is being grateful for God's blessing. And look at what he's saying here. Regardless of whatever situation. I am a parent. Guess what? I've taught my kids to say thank you. To every little things that people give them. Or whatever little things that you know other people do for them. And even for us. That culture of entitlement sometimes in our society goes to our church. That everybody feels they're entitled. Instead of saying thank you, they feel like, oh, rightly so. We have to be careful. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Look at his situation. I know what it's to be in need or to have plenty. Look at the 
contrast here in need or having plenty, well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I have taught my kids, whatever food that we put on the table, you should be grateful because there's food on the table. It's whether some food that you may like or you don't like, we're going to go partake that because that's a blessing from the Lord. But yet we have given so many choices to our kids. Oh, this food is not nice. I want you to cook me this and that. I'm saying, no, I'm not cooking you this and that because that's not the food that we're going to eat today. And you should be grateful there's food on your table. Come on now. Instead of catering to all the whims of our kids. We're teaching them to be ungrateful. God, sometimes God supplies abundantly. So Paul says, guess what? I have learned to live in prosperity. And I'm grateful because there's much. All of us wants that lesson from the Lord. Lord, teach me a lesson about prosperity. I'd gladly do that. You have to be careful for what you pray for. And also sometimes God will help support. But also Paul says that I have learned to be grateful even if I am in need or if I am hungry. Hello. At those times, Paul learned to be grateful with God's blessing in his life. Let me ask you this. Are you a grateful person? Let me give you a test. And of course, you have to not shout it out loud. Just answer it in your mind. But if you want to share it with the people with you, then it's up to you. But here are four tests for me. Let me ask you these four questions to check if you have an ungrateful heart. Here's the first one. Do you enjoy what you have? Do you enjoy what you have? Or do you have this always, you know, discontent that this is not enough and I have to have more? You're almost looking at the magazine or what? Do you enjoy what you have? Have you taken the time to just enjoy what God has given you? And here's the next test. Do you compare yourself to others? Oh, I got this phone and it's an old phone. I need to get a new phone. I saw my neighbor. They have a new car. I just bought this car a year ago. Now it's just too, you know, old and I need to. Uh... Do you compare yourself to others? Oh, she's already a victory group leader. I am not. Oh, she's in our group. More of our group members like her, not me. Comparing your gifts to other people. Oh, I wanted to sing, but you can't sing. That's the problem. Your gift is another thing, but you're looking comparing, and you feel like God doesn't like you because of what you don't have. Do you enjoy what you have? I know some Christians that are covetous on what they hope to get that they can't enjoy what they have right now. Also, do you compare yourself with others? Always looking and comparing and being jealous with what they have. Number three questions. Do you regularly and joyfully give thanks to God? Are you just overwhelmed by the goodness of the Lord? When was the last time really you took that time to give thanks to God? And here's the last one. Test, question. Do you rejoice when others prosper? Ooh, that's tough for some. When you see a brother or sister in the Lord get blessed by God, do you rejoice? Or deep inside you're jealous? When they get a new house, when they buy a new car, or automatically you think negative stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got a car, maybe he's stealing money. What's that? Four tests for us. And here's the last one. Contentment is possible through Christ who gives us strength. Paul says, here's what he said, that I have learned the secret to be what? In contentment, to being content. I have learned. Let me just read that. Here's what he said. I have learned the secret of being content. In every situation. And then he answers that in verse 13. I can do everything to him who gives me strength. Let me just say this. 
right away. This is one of the well-known verse in the book of Philippians, but also it's also notoriously misused and abused by a lot of people. What do I mean? Let me just say what does what it does not mean. This verse does not mean that it's a blanket of endorsement that God will support anything we set out to do and empower us to do whatever impossible things we can imagine. No, that's not what the verse says. A lot of people quote this, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength and do whatever they want to do. No, wrong. First and foremost, God would not enable us or give us strength if we are living in sin. If you're quoting this verse because you want to rob a bank, God's not going to do all things for you. Or you're quoting this verse is because you're living in a wrong relationship and God will, you know, and I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength. No, it's not. Never. Or any foolish, reckless, or sinful action that is not in line with His, is not in line with His promise. Your foolishness is not in line with His promise. No. So what does it mean? One important rule when you're interpreting a scripture, which is what we're going to teach in our How to Study the Bible, is to pay attention to the context of the verse. And I believe most of us are quoting this out of context. And what is the context that we're talking about? Contentment. Several times from chapter uh, what, chapter 4, verses 10 to 13, twice that he mentioned about contentment. And I think the overall context is about contentment. So if you're going to read this text, actually, is this is about learning to be content. So we could change this, actually. I could be, or I can do everything, or I can be content in every, in any situation through him who strengthens me. That's what actually what it is. The contentment does not come from our own willpower, but from our trust in God. God is the one who's going to give us the strength to respond to whatever situation and whatever circumstance that He put us in with a steadfast, joyful contentment. So this is not a statement about removing the problems when you declare that, but God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right? This is not about that. Or, the, 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 uh, you know, removing the difficulty, the problems that you're facing. And then that God would supply the strength or the resources, you know. But this is about what? A firm belief that God would supply the strength and the resources and the strength in Christ for us to face whatever we might encounter as we are pursuing His will in our lives. Following Him, obeying His will. Notice the balance between these texts. I can do everything. That's the first one. Some Christians put too much emphasis on the first. I can do everything. That means in which we end up burning out because I can do all things in my own strength. That's not what it is. I can do everything, Lord. And then we quote this verse, but yet we are the one doing the, 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 the working and we're doing, we're accomplishing things on our strength. And also others put emphasis on through him who strengthens me. Uh, this other extreme is that, oh Lord, I can do everything through you who gives me strength. That means I'm not going to do anything. No! We just sit around passively not doing anything because we think that this is God who's going to do everything. No, 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 no. I can do your part. Everything through Christ who strengthens me. I can do that means as we put our faith and trust in Jesus and follow His will, He provides us to what? The strength to accomplish what He has called us to do. A good example of this is that as you're going through some situations in your life. Maybe you are in need. I can do all things. Lord, this is the thing that you have put me. Because I follow your will. You know? Because I have followed you and not disown you now in this situation, then Lord, thank you that you're going to give me the strength to overcome this. That's what Paul was saying. The correct biblical balance is that I do it, but I do it by the con but my constant dependence on the power of Christ who dwells in me. 
I can do it. But I do it by my constant dependence on the power of Christ who dwells in me. So when you quote this, look at your situation, you look at your marriage, I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Lord, that means first and foremost, I need to be content with this relationship. This relationship is a blessing from you. You know, as we go through these challenges in my marriage, Lord, help me, give me the strength to depend on you to go through this. That is the challenge for us. You see, contentment is not based on the circumstance because most of us based on that. It's For most people, contentment is based on the circumstance. Paul says now. Some people says, you know, some people base their what? Their contentment on their emotion. I'm happy today. I'm content. I'm lonely today. No. It's not based on that. It's based on what? Being sustained through our dependence on Christ Jesus. Let me encourage you today. Are you content with your life? That God has given you today, or you're constantly looking somewhere, anywhere, or maybe you need to stop and to ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do? Maybe you're not contented because you are doing a lot of things that God had not called you to do. Not because you have a lot of money, that means there's contentment. Not because there's a lack of money, that means there is discontent. It is a total dependence on God regardless of the situation. I think that's the message of the Lord for us today. As we celebrate this Thanksgiving, let's be grateful. Let's find this contentment. I know some of us are going to be what shopping, buying. Please, by all means, if you need to buy something, it's something that you need. But it's not because to feel some void in your heart, to feel valuable. Now you're mad at God because you don't have the money to buy what you need just to make you feel happy. God's goal for your life is not to make you feel happy. The last time I checked, I read my Bible. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, you take up what? Your cross daily and you follow me. Cross is a picture of not being happy. But that we are joyful because we're depending on him. Not on my circumstance. You think when you get that house, you're going to be content? You get to get that car, you're going to be content. Those are tools. Just means. Let me encourage you today. Let me encourage you. Comes with our total dependence on Him. On Him. That's the power to strengthen us to overcome what we're facing because He's the one who has placed us in that situation. Amen? Join me in a word of prayer, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God. Lord, forgive us. I felt this, and this is something that is in my heart. That God is an impressed. If you're here today and you're sensing this, that there's that discontent because you have believed the lie that this world is peddling. Certain things, circumstance for your contentment. It is not to be doesn't matter if you're a leader or not leader. I'm not talking about that. But you know that you base your contentment on the circumstance in your feelings. God is saying, no. Total dependence on me, my son, my daughter. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand and say, that's me. Put an emoji hand and let me pray for you. Lord, thank you. I pray for my brothers and sisters today. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for God once again teaching us. Or joyful in Christ and contentment is in you and you alone that we could be content Lord whatever circumstance according to the Apostle Paul or in every situation because it's our total dependence on your power that dwells in us according to Paul God it's just we could learn this through our relationship Lord with you pray for my brothers and sisters Lord we're in 
or the enemy is trying to lie to them, trick them. Lord, I pray for Ke Keisha, Lord, today. Pray for Myra, for Demi, for Yvonne, for Bithia, for Lara, for Joyce, for Jenny Rose, for Ida, for Clang. For today, change our mindset. For Josefina, Lord, who's watching, change our hearts. Material things will never make us happy or contented. Never. Relationships that are even from you will not make us content, Lord. It's you. Teach us, God, and in, and in need and in want, in plenty or in need and in scarcity. May we rest in you. Pray for Miriam as well, for Stephen who's watching, for Gail. Most of the time, God, we reflect and deflect this to the people around us. But yet, the person, the heart that needs to be dealt with is ours. Forgive us. Pray for Jonavi as well. Lord, we pray. We humble ourselves before you. If you raise your hands and said, and you gave that emoji, and if you're watching, you're still shy to put that, it's fine. But let me ask you to pray this and say, Lord, say this, Lord. Come on, say it, Lord. I submit to you. I humble myself. Forgive me for listening to the voice of the world, world. But Lord, today I listen to your voice. In whatever situation that you put me in, Lord, plenty or want, need, regardless. You're going to give me, I'm, I'm totally depending on you. Because the strength to overcome comes from you. Help us. Lord, I pray for thee as well, who's watching. Lord, thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen.